All right, let me know when you see it up live on, on YouTube. And, and normally it takes a couple of minutes for me to. Is your lab back open yet, Denise? Uh, we're open to, everybody's two days on, two days off, and we have two okay. shifts per day. So they're working either really early or really late. <laughs> so. yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I would take the late shift any day. I mean, the people coming in at 6 a.m., I can't, I cannot fathom how they're doing that. Right, but Joe, for example, he normally gets up at three in the morning. And so 6 a.m. is well into his day. <laughs> and so, but, but for most people, bonkers. either end is pretty challenging, so. That's true, yeah. A lot of people really would prefer to just do like nine to five regular hours, that kind of thing, right? Yeah, that was hard. Is it because you're at like 25% capacity or 50%, something like that? Yeah, I think we're supposed to be at, I think technically we're supposed to be at something like 15%, but that's, I think we're at, we're at 25%. Um, but it, we can make it seem like 15% because we don't have any undergrads in the lab. Normally we have a lot of undergrads in the lab, so. Right, but because of the summertime, right? You probably changed all your, your undergrad and, and plans. Because we just feel like the first people who would be disallowed from the lab would be the undergrads because there's too many of them and, you know, they probably, um, well, they're not on campus anyway, but. Yeah, no, it's, I mean, it's hard in California right now, right? Where things are pretty feeling uncertain, I'm sure. Yeah, all term, who knows? Right, I mean, hey, at least you guys, uh, if you needed to, you could probably have classes uh, sitting sitting out on the beach, right? <laughs> Isn't that what Santa Barbara is? That's my, that's my impression. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I have a slide at the very end that will show you exactly the view from our lab. And, um, oh, don't, oh, <laughs> I don't even want to see. I'll just, I'll just be too jealous. Um, all right. So yeah, we'll get, we'll, um, we'll let it go just a couple minutes uh, after the hour to let the stragglers come in. Speaking as a usual straggler, I know people appreciate having a few more. It's funny that we're still late to meetings, even yeah even when there's yeah for me because these are a little early in the morning i tend to watch them later on youtube but <laughs> yeah sorry about the 8 a.m time point for you guys yeah sorry. thanks know. for getting up early for this i appreciate it yeah, yeah, yeah. it's okay <laughs> it's all right anything uh, earlier than eight i've i've disallowed like anything earlier than eight i'm just like no <laughs> are people inviting you to like 6 a.m meetings well, it used to be that people on the East Coast would organize meetings that would start at eight East Coast Ooh. time, you know, and when you were traveling, you would travel there and it was very painful, but you would do it, you know, and now I just said, no, you, you'll you need to start that meeting at 10 a.m. your time or, or 11 a.m. your time or something. You know, so. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. And, you know, with, with this time that we picked, um, it works for a range of people, but we definitely have folks, you know, in Australia who want to watch it. And Absolutely. But that's why YouTube's so good. So. Yeah. Okay. Trying to make sure I got all my stuff ready here. I'm really in awe of those images. They're pretty stunning. Yeah. Joe's I guess that's why you chose them. Joe's got a good eye. <laughs> All right, um, what do you guys say we go ahead and get started? Yeah? Sounds good. All right, um, hi everybody. Welcome to this week's installment of the Cell Migration Seminar Series. Uh, so before we get started, just a couple of quick things. Um, Probably most of you know this, but for anyone who's tuning in for the first time, uh, the way that we do questions is we wait till all at the end and um, you can either type your question into the chat window 
Um, or if you want to write the word question, we'll basically call on you and then you can unmute and put on your video if you want, and you can ask your question yourself. And we definitely encourage that uh, to get a little bit of, of interaction. Um, so, but either way uh, is, is good. Um, the next thing is that we'll be sending out a survey this week and our goal is to gauge interest for continuing the series in the fall. So um, if you get that email or if you see it on Twitter, please respond to that to, to weigh in. We really want your girls' feedback um, to see whether or not we should keep pursuing this. All right, so uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce this week's speaker. So we have Denise Montel. Uh, Denise is a distinguished professor of molecular, cellular, and developmental biology at the University of California, Santa Barbara. So she previously worked at John Hopkins Medical Center. Uh, when she was there, she rose from assistant to associate to full professor, and she's the founding director of the Center for Cell Dynamics. So then in 2013, uh, Denise moved back west, returned to her roots at the University of California. And uh, there the Montel lab identifies understudied, uh, perhaps also known as quirky cell behaviors. Um, and they unravel their underlying molecular and uh, mechanical mechanisms. So Denise Montel pioneered studying border cells in the Drosophila ovary as an in vivo model of collective cell migration. And um, we've actually already seen a couple of talks in this series uh, about the Drosophila ovary. And so it's been, um, it's really exciting to have her here to, uh, to talk more about that. And so she's also an elected fellow of the American Society of Cell Biology and of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. And she's a recipient of the NIH Director's Pioneer Award. So. That's a lot of stuff. Um, we're really excited to have her here and um, I'll let her go ahead and get started. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for that introduction and thanks so much for inviting me. I've been really enjoying this series of, uh, of talks and I'm so grateful to you for organizing it. So, you know, in my lab, what we're interested in generally is how cells behave normally when they build, maintain and regenerate uh, tissues and then how they misbehave in diseases like cancer. And our mission is to take notice of novel cell behaviors and then elucidate their physiological significance and tease apart the underlying molecular mechanisms. So for many of our studies, uh, we use this model system shown here, the Drosophila ovary, and as you just mentioned, um, you've already been introduced to it for um, those of you who've been attending these uh, seminars. And I'll just say that um, the reason we really love this system is because of the um, rich diversity of biological questions that can be addressed using it, this simple and beautiful anatomy of the tissue, and the powerful experimental tools that we have available to us in, in Drosophila, not to mention the you know, long history of success in using Drosophila to solve fundamental problems in biology. So uh, the ovary is really made up of these individual strands of developing uh, egg chambers. And there are stem cells at the very tip of this structure, both germline and somatic stem cells. And the progeny of those cells assemble into these little ovals that are called egg chambers, which further grow and develop into mature eggs. So if we zoom in on one of these uh, strands of developing egg chambers, uh, the, as I said, the, the stem cells are at the tip there. And then when they assemble into these little uh, structures, there are these 16 germ cells in the center, and they're surrounded by a monolayer epithelium of follicle cells. Um, it, the 16 germ lines in the center are composed of 15 uh, polyploid nerve cells and one oocyte, and it's the oocyte that grows and matures into the egg, and the nerve cells are these uh, support cells. So, um, there are so many different biological questions that one can really address using the system, but one that we've been interested in, um, uh, particularly interested in for a long time is, as you mentioned, the collective migration of the border cells. And so uh, the, uh, so right, those are the follicular epithelial cells. The border cells develop within this follicular epithelium at the anterior end, and then they migrate at this stage, stage nine, um, in between, squeezing in between the nerve cells until they arrive at the anterior border of the oocyte. So here's a, a movie. Um, and as I said, we've been interested in this uh, topic for a long time. And, and when, we, when I first started studying it back in the day when I was a postdoc, we really didn't know a single gene that was required for this process. And we couldn't do the live imaging that you see here. 
Now, border cells migrate collectively. And back, again, back to the, you know, when I first started working on this, uh, there were three th things about this migration that were just seemed totally weird at the time. One is that the cells were moving as a group instead of as individual cells. The field was pretty much focused on fibroblasts migrating on fibronectin coated cover slips. In addition, we learned a lot of really interesting and important things about cell migration from that kind of model. But here we have this group of cells. The group is composed of two different kinds of cells and it's squeezing in between other cells. It's not migrating on matrix. And so all of those things seem very strange. But now, um, now we know um, that border cells kind of re resemble disseminating tumor cells. So um, this is a, an actual image of a breast cancer metastasis from Andy Ewald's lab. Um, and you can see uh, the similarity and, and these um, in structure to, to a border cell cluster. Uh, disseminating tumor cells can also be groups of cells, can be groups of two different kinds of cells, um, as, as are the border cells. And um, in addition, cells, both during normal development and in tumor metastasis, can end up uh, squeezing in between other cells. So this is a mammary organoid, again, from Andy Ewald. And um, you can see this cell that's labeled with GFP is squeezing in between all the other cells in this structure. And then this is a beautiful movie from um, Peter Friedel's lab showing an orthotopically implanted human tumor into a mouse. And you can see that the tumor cells in green here are migrating all over each other. And they're also migrating on the mouse muscle. So we think these uh, properties, collective migration, heterotypic uh, associations of different types of cells and cells squeezing through other cells in between other cells are actually quite uh, general characteristics now that we have the ability to really look inside of developed of organs and tissues. So, um, so today, uh, you know, and we've we've uh, done a lot of genetic screens and identified uh, the signaling pathways that activate motility in these cells and and so on. Um, but today, I want to tell you a couple of uh, new-ish stories. I'll say they're new because we're just. Um, just publishing them right now, but as we've been working on these stories for years and some of you have heard earlier versions of it, um, but I'm gonna update you on, on these two stories today. So the first one is um, concerns, uh, you know, we've studied a lot of the mechanisms that are autonomous to the border cells themselves um, in regulating their migration. But what we've uh, understood less about is the environment through which they're migrating. And we know that there's ample evidence in, in vitro, particularly, that the physical or mechanical environment can um, steer migrating cells. Um, and there are some studies, um, both in vitro and in vivo, that concern you know, the role of tissue stiffness or uh, substrate stiffness um, and how that can guide cells. But we feel that a question that's been kind of understudied is, um, you know, what about tissue topography? What about the geometry and geography of this um, of this tissue, and does that have any influence on um, cells, uh, the pathway selection? So, if we think about pathway selection for the border cells, what we have known for a very long time is that there are chemoattractants. These are secreted proteins that are um, produced, we, we have always presumed they're produced in, in gradients, although we hadn't seen them, we hadn't been able to see the gradients. Um, and we know that these chemotractants bind to two different receptor tyrosine kinases, the fly homolog of the EGF receptor and the fly homolog of the PDGF and VEGF receptor um, called PBR. So the RTKs, the receptors are expressed on all the follicle cells, including the border cells, and the ligands are produced in the germline. And so the question we, I want to address today is, well, do these ligands really fully explain pathway selection? And we've known about these ligands for a long time, but um, we only recently noticed that there's actually more uh, choices than we would have imagined for the border cells, uh, more pathways available to them than we really thought. When you look at a typical lateral view of an egg chamber that looks like this, and this one's um, stained with eukaterin antibody in, in uh, black and white here and in white here. There's a, a basement membrane that's surrounding the outside that's in magenta here, and then the nuclei are stained in blue, and the border cells are in green. 
and they just migrate straight down this path right here. And so you'd think, well, they just need to migrate from anterior to posterior. But if you take a section through this egg chamber and look at the cross section, so you're looking at the, the view that the border cells have, what you can see is that they have many other paths available to them besides this central path that they stay on. And we can look at the whole, um, the whole egg chamber as the border cells go through it. We're just gonna slice through the egg chamber. So we're starting at the anterior end of the egg chamber here. And here's the tip of the border cell protrusion as, there, as it's extending in between the nurse cells here. And now if we look at the path from their point of view, as they migrate, you can see that many alternative paths appear and disappear. And we've counted them up. And we think there's about 40 different ways they could in principle go, um, but they don't. They just migrate down the center path. So we're going to ask, you know, they have lots of options. What is it? How do they always choose the central path? Which is frankly, not even something we really considered in the past. <laughs> so the first question is, do the, does the distribution of extracellular ligands, is there, in addition to there being some kind of anterior posterior gradient of these ligands, is there potentially also a medial lateral gradient of these ligands that could explain um, this uh, choosing of the central path? So in order to observe the extracellular gradients of these ligands, um, what postdoc, uh, a former postdoc of mine, Wei Dai did was to CRISPR tag, um, insert uh, small tags into um, the loci that encode the, all the various ligands that the uh, border cells are responding to. And, um, and I'm showing you one of them here. It's a ligand for the EGF receptor. It's called Karen. Um, and she inserted this N, uh, HA tag into the N terminus of the mature peptide. And if we uh, look at that, we can look at living unpermeabilized tissue and we can see the uh, HA tagged Karen ligand. And we can actually measure that there is indeed an anterior low to posterior high gradient. And that's what you see here. But when we measure <clears throat> from medial to lateral, what we see is that it, the concentration of Karen is not higher medial than it is lateral. So it doesn't seem likely that this, the distribution of this ligand is, um, is accounting for uh, the propensity of the cells to stay on the central path. But many of the other tags that we tried uh, tagging the other ligands didn't work. And so we couldn't be sure whether maybe one of the other ligands might um, be localized in a medial lateral gradient. So what we did was take a close look at, the, um, at what happens when we either by RNAi or expressing dominant negative receptors, we block the function or expression of both receptor tyrosine kinases. And when that happens, what we see is that there's definitely a defect in the border cells getting to the oocyte, and that we've known for a long time. They, the border cells tend to stop partway through their migration. But there's no defect in selecting the, or there's, it's rare for there to be a, a defect in them selecting this central path. In about 10% of these cases, you'll see the cells migrate off the central path. So that means that the vast majority of central path selection is due to something else other than ligand receptor signaling. So further evidence that there's something besides this ligand, the ligands and receptors that are steering the cells toward the center comes from an experiment like this. So here in this little patch of green cells right here, we're misexpressing PVF1, one of the ligands. And again, we, uh, Jocelyn McDonald, when she was in my lab, showed that if you misexpress PVF1 at a very high level in, in a patch of cells, you can uh, steer the border cells to that ectopic uh, patch of ligand. However, what's interesting is when the cells reach the, the patch of cells and these cells are continuously secreting this ligand, they don't stay there. They nevertheless um, still prefer to migrate to the central path. So there seems to be something um, that can uh, override um, ligand concentration. So something other than ligand RTK signaling must be responsible for the majority of medial gu uh, lateral guidance. So what is it? Now, one trivial possibility would be if there was like a tunnel down the center of the egg chamber, some opening on the scale of the size of the border cell cluster. 
um, that would make it you know, uh, easy for them to go in. And this we don't see. So you can, you've seen this already. This is where all the nurse cell, uh, uh, nurse cells are coming together. And you can see in this center, there's really not an opening, you know, sort of the size of a border cell cluster. So what's special? Well, we thought we might have a clue because of of all the many loss of function mutations we've looked at over the many years we've been working on this um, system, there's only one that we've ever found a, a defect in central path selection. And that's shown here. You can see this nice movie that um, Sharon Go, who's a um, student in the lab took. And what you can see is that the border cells are actually migrating in between the nurse cells and the follicle cells instead of choosing that central path. And this uh, mutant condition is where we have knocked down the uh, E. cadherin in the nurse cells. So remember, the border cells are squeezing in between the nurse cells as they migrate. And this is staining for E. cadherin here. And so normally, they're choosing the nurse cells um, to migrate, and they're squeezing in between them. And there's no extracellular matrix here. This is a cell on cell migration, and E. cadherin is the adhesion molecule of importance. But if we knock down E. cadherin from the, from the germ cells, the border cells then migrate in between the follicle cells and the nurse cells um, rather than down the center. And you can see that um, there's a really drastic defect in, uh, in mediolateral guidance in this case. Um, as opposed to um, when we knock down the ligands for the receptor tyrosine kinases, there's uh, only 10% of uh, cases where there's any kind of mediolateral um, guidance defect. So we wondered if there was an E cadherin gradient that might provide a haptotactic guidance cue for the border cells, either E cadherin low in the center and high on the outside or high in the center and low on the outside. You could argue either way um, that they might prefer to go towards high levels of E cadherin or towards low levels of E cadherin. Um, and so here, Jim Mondo, who um, just got his PhD, uh, he used uh, light sheet imaging to near isotropic light sheet imaging so that he could carefully quantify the levels of eucadherin on every nurse cell surface. And when he did that, um, you can see these uh, images here where he quantified both F-actin using phylloidin and eucadherin. This is the interface between the nurse cells and the follicle cells around the outside. And then he has each individual um, uh, surface. Then what he found was that there was no difference um, between lateral and no, no statistical difference between lateral and medial surfaces, either in E. cadherin or in F. actin. Um, so then Joe Campanelli, who's a postdoc in the lab, thought, well, maybe there's a difference in E. cadherin dynamics, you know, internalization dynamics or um, lifetime on the cell membrane or whatever. And so he did um, FRAP experiments and he showed that there was no difference in the recovery time either uh, for E. cadherin um, when he photobleached either on a central path or on a side path. So, um, and then um, and then Wei Dai did the following experiment, which was to create an artificial gradient of E. cadherin within the egg chamber. And when um, when she did this we found that it did not cause any medial lateral guidance defects. So um, the cells didn't follow this path that has higher levels of E. cadherin or they didn't um, follow. And we manipulated E. cadherin in many different ways. And we could show that it, no matter what you did to E. cadherin um, in terms of creating an artificial difference in concentration, um, that that was not sufficient to steer the cells. So, um, and so that's shown here when in this mosaic overexpression experiment where there's uh, virtually no medial lateral guidance defect as opposed to the germline knockdown where there is. So taken together, we conclude that E. cadherin is a permissive cue. It's absolutely essential that there's some E. cadherin uh, for the border cells to migrate and they need it for traction. And we showed that, but I don't have time to go into the data. So um, we know that there's, um, that, meet, that cadherin's providing uh, traction for the cells to migrate on um, and it's necessary that it be present but the concentration is not uh, instructive in terms of telling them where to go. 
So we wanted to know, well, is there anything different about the center path compared to um, the side paths there? You know, it's not the ligand concentration, that's not the eco-adherent concentration. Um, and so what Wei did was to um, very carefully reconstruct in three dimensions um, every cell in the egg chamber, and here's the border cells, and uh, take a look at a lot of different things. And I'm gonna cut a long story short and say that there are lots of things that are different about the central path, but most of them aren't important. <laughs> so I'm gonna skip to what is important. And so one thing that's very obvious here, if we look at a cross section through the egg chamber, is that the central path is where many nerve cells come together. And in fact, you can see that most of these side paths that would be the alternatives for the border cells are interfaces between two cells. So I'm gonna call, uh, where two cells meet, I'm gonna call that an interface and where more than two cells meet, I'm gonna call that a juncture. And I'm gonna call it a juncture instead of a junction because a reviewer made this comment, a reviewer of our paper, and I think it was a good one that junction for a cell biology means adherence junction, you know, gap junction, like some kind of molecular junction but just a place where cells are coming together and the nerve cells are not epithelial cells, so they don't have those traditional kinds of tight junctions or anything, um, but a place where cells come together. We're gonna to call that a juncture. Okay, so what Wei did was to map where all the, the distribution of two cell interfaces, three cell junctures, and more than three cell junctures. And that's shown here on this um, beautiful image where uh, each line is a three cell juncture. Each dot is where more than three cells come together. Um, and here in the same egg chamber, you can see the two cell interfaces. So there's a lot of things you can see here. The two cell interfaces are way more, like represent way more area than um, these multiple cell junction, junctures. And the multiple cell junctures, um, actually uh, you can see there's almost continuous tracks of three cell junctures along the central path, though there's some also on the side. And then these um, more than three cell junctures are highly concentrated in the center. And so you can see that in, if we just abstract out the junctures here and interfaces here. Okay, so this is a plot of the density of those three cell junctures or more than three cell junctures as a function of medial lateral position in the egg chamber. And you can see that it makes a beautiful gradient. So. So there's, uh, med there's no medial lateral gradient of ligand, there's no medial lateral gradient of eucadherin, but there's a medial lateral gradient of this geom geometry information. Okay, but so what? <laughs> like what would, what would that mean? Um, and so uh, what, we, what we found, we first predicted and then found is that there are actually slightly larger extracellular spaces where multiple nerve cells meet. And that you can see here in this experiment where we took a fluorescently labeled 10,000 uh, Dalton dextran and incubated a living egg chamber in it. And the dextran fills extracellular spaces but doesn't, uh, doesn't go inside the cells. And so you can see these uh, spaces that accumulate. And here, um, this interface of between two cells, there's very little labeling where three cells come together, there's more, four cells more, and here's a place where six cells are coming together. And you can see that the space increases. So why is that? Well, I think it's um, pretty intuitively obvious that if you were to take a bunch of balls and put them together, that, that the spaces between three would be smaller than the spaces between four. And fortunately, we don't have to rely purely on um, billiard balls are our intuition, but there's actually math that this describes this. And uh, we teamed up with um, some physicist friends of ours, uh, Yuan Chen Kao, who works in Weir John Rappel's lab at UCSD, as well as our uh, longtime collaborator, Nir Gov, at the Weizmann Institute. And they helped us, uh, you know, formalize and mathematically describe the difference in expected spaces between um, places where more, uh, more cells meet. Now, obviously cells are not billiard balls, they um, can deform. Um, and, uh, and so that's um, taken into account. But I just wanna point out that if we uh, put on the same graph our, the, what this uh, geometry model predicts for the uh, relative space that you would find where four cells come together, five cells come together, six cells come together, et cetera. 
and you compare that to our actual measurements, you see that there's very good agreement. Okay, but what does that little bit of extra space do? Remember, there's no, no tunnel here. This is a really tiny extra space. So what does that do? And um, as we thought about it, we thought, well, maybe um, actually what happens is that a space that's very small, nevertheless can be quite significant in terms of lowering the energy barrier for the cells to protrude into that region. Because even a space that's as large as an extracellular domain of E. coherin would be large enough to separate the two nerve cells from one another. So if the nerve cells are normally zipped up together by E. coherin, E. coherin interactions, then in a place where the cells couldn't quite touch and there was a little bit of empty space, then for a cell to protrude into that space, it doesn't have to break the bonds that it has to break when it's protruding in between two tightly zipped together cells. And so we thought, hmm, maybe that makes uh, an easy way versus a hard way. So may, the, the uh, hypothesis is that even tiny spaces, much smaller than a cell or a cluster, reduce the need for the protrusions to unzip nurse cell nurse cell adhesions, creating a path of least resistance. So, um, so here's the, the idea is that geometry favors protrusions into multiple cell junctions. So if you have two cells, the um, border cell to protrude into, it has to unzip those adhesions. If you have three cells, there's a little more space. And um, so there's fewer adhesions to unzip. And the more cells that come together, the more space there is. So, um, and so what, uh, what Lay did was to actually um, measure the frequency with which protrusions extended either between into these two cell interfaces or into these uh, three or more than three uh, th three cell uh, junctures. And so even though remember the two cell interfaces represent the vast majority of the available area, um, the protrusions are much more frequently found in between um, in the three cell junctures than in the two cell interfaces. So we uh, predicted then that given a choice, cells would protrude into junctures where more cells come together. So the more cells that come together, the more available space there is and the more favorable, energetically favorable that would be. Um, and so, oops, sorry. Um, okay, and so what Wei did was to find amongst her movies cases where, uh, and it turns out not to be that rare, that um, the border cells encounter two different paths with uh, multiple cell junctures. And when they find that, they actually protrude into both of them. Um, but one always wins. And so in this case, this is a three cell juncture and this is a more than three cell juncture. And in every case that she looked at, the border cells uh, always eventually migrated in the direction of the multiple, uh, the greater number of cells coming together. Okay, so at this point, uh, Yuan Shen and Wu Zhan and Nier developed a, a formal um, model uh, to, we tried to model the border cells um, and their movement and ask the question whether the combination of chemotractin and topography would be sufficient to explain uh, border cell behavior. And so um, they developed uh, this uh, model and, um, and we're representing here the border cells as a point particle uh, representing the uh, center of mass and it's moving in a 3D geometry that's actually a realistic geometry derived from imaging a real egg chamber. And uh, according to our experimentally derived uh, rules of believing that there's a, a chemoattractant and a topography term. Okay, and so they made this model use and, um, and then um, we made this uh, graphical, we did simulations of how the particle would move in, um, in this situation you, according to those two terms. And the output of that simulation um, could be a point in a graph, but what we did was to map this um, movement onto the anatomy of the egg chamber in this simulation that you see here. So here's our egg chamber, we're cutting out and looking at the center, and now here's our point particle that's moving um, in the egg chamber. And what we could, and here it is relative to those three cells and more than three cell junctures. Um, and so, uh, and then the blue line is leaving behind the trace of the path that the border cells took. And, um, and you can see that here. So the green lines are the three cell junctures and the, um, the nodes here are the more than uh, three cell junctures. 
So I just want to point out that this animation was um, made by my son, um, Brandon Montel, who um, was in between, he was taking a little month break between working uh, on Google Earth and working at Pixar. And he's a software engineer. And so this was a, a fun project. And the first time that two Montels are um, co-authoring a paper. And so that's my hashtag proud mom. Um, okay, so uh, modeling, right. So that was when we um, simulate uh, the trajectory of cell of the border cells in under normal conditions. But now we can also simulate the experiment, the kind of experimental manipulations that we had been making. And so, um, and so for example, here is again, this one representative trajectory of the, you know, sort of control normal um, situation. Then we can remove the, for example, remove the chemo attractant term and say, well, what happens? And what happens is just as in our experiments, the border cells migrate port part way, they stay on the central path, but they stop short of their, uh, of migrating to the oocyte. By contrast, if we remove the uh, topography term and leave the chemo attractant there, we see the border cells will still migrate posteriorly, but they, um, they don't take the central path reliably. And then if we, this is not something we can do experimentally. So both of these things, um, we can we can approach experimentally, but this thing we can't. If we um, remove both the geometry and the chemo attractant, then the border cells just kind of make these short and random uh, trajectories. So the great thing about simulations is that you can do lots of them. And so this is a summary of um, uh, this is a summary of 99 simulations under each of the conditions I just described to you. So the control uh, where the border cells migrate this way no chemo attractant where they stop short of the oocyte, the no topographical preference where they take these random paths but they still migrate posteriorly to the oocyte. And then if we remove both of those terms and they just uh, move uh, pretty randomly. And we can quantify that and we can show uh, the relative contributions and I don't necessarily go through that. Okay, so I wanna address a question that you might be thinking, which is how do we know it's not really so, so. It's not really something else about the center path normally that's keeping the cells there. So it might be this topography thing. The simulations show that that in principle could explain it. But what if there's something else we don't know about? What if there's a chemo repellent gradient coming from the outside, or so just something else, or an unknown ligand receptor signaling um, that's that's concentrated in the center? And so um, we said about that's a hard question to address, but we found a way to address it experimentally. So here is a cross section through an egg chamber and here are the border cells in between and here's where all these nurse cells are coming together. And um, we, uh, we found some uh, mutants that disturb the uh, pattern of cell divisions in the, in the early uh, germ line cluster. And so we have egg chambers, unusual egg chambers with unusual geometry where we have 31 nurse cells now instead of 15. And when there are 31 nerve cells, they pack in kind of strange ways. And here, for example, you can see that there are two nerve cells in the middle, whereas that normally doesn't happen. And the cells have to choose between the geometric center, which is a two cell interface, and a multiple cell uh, juncture, which is not at the geometric center. So if there was something else steering the cells to the geometric center besides these junctures, then we would expect the cells to stay in the center here. But what we found was that in each case we were able to examine, uh, the border cells chose the multiple cell junctures over the geometric center of the egg chamber. And so, um, and so then we could redo our simulation uh, using this 31 nerve cell geometry instead of the normal uh, 15 nerve cell geometry. And when we did that, we could recapitulate this um, uh, off-center trajectory that followed the multiple cell junctures um, uh, rather than following the geometric center. And we could compare the results we were getting with the simulation to the results we were getting in our experiments, even though we could do a lot more simulations than we could do experiments. These actions are really hard to get um, a hold of and, and do the imaging on. But nevertheless, the, um, the results matched really nicely. 
That wasn't the only condition where we could kind of separate um, uh, separate out the geometric center and the multiple cell junctures. Here's one more example, but we have several examples. Um, this is an example where the E coherent knockdown in the germ cells is forcing the border cells to migrate in between the nerve cells and the follicle cells. And what you can see is that where you have a follicle cell, nerve cell, nerve cell junction, juncture, there's more, um, more space. This is labeling with dextran again, than when you have um, just a nerve cell, nerve cell or a nerve cell follicle cell. Nerve cell follicle cell juncture here, uh, you know, much less space. And a uh, nerve cell, nerve cell follicle cell junction here, juncture here, more space. And what we found was that, um, was that in live imaging of examples like this, that the border cells tended to follow these grooves where, uh, where more cells come together and our simulations um, could reproduce that behavior. Um, okay. So, and the last uh, bit of experimental evidence that I'll tell you about is that um, near the end of migration, the, the topography cues get weaker and the chemo attractant cues get stronger. And so what ends up happening is that this is sufficient to steer the cells into um, a place that is suboptimal from the geometry point of view into a two cell interface. So, so for most, what I've told you so far, we've been analyzing the part of the nerve cell, uh, the part of the border cell trajectory where they stay on this central path. So this, this part of the trajectory, but near the end of migration, the border cells um, move dorsally. And they, they do that in response to uh, a chemo attractant called gherkin, which unlike the others is concentrated um, dorsally. Okay, close to the oocyte nucleus. And so what we see, these are uh, traces from several movies, and we can see that the border cells stay centrally for most of their uh, trajectory, and then they, uh, then they move off to the dorsal side. And this is now, when we add this GERC ingredient into our model, um, we can recapitulate this dorsal turn in the simulations. And this is uh, you know, now 99 of those simulations. So what I mean by the, the topography cues weaken is that you can see that these multiple cell junctures are concentrated near the center of the egg chamber and there are many of them here. And then there are no, no more of them from here to here. There's still these three cell junctures which should be preferable to the two cell interface. But the ligand concentration is now high, uh, high enough that um, the chemo attractant dominates over the geometry cue. So, uh, okay, so what I've told you then in this first part of the talk is that border cells integrate orthogonal chemical and physical cues. So there's an anterior to posterior, oops, there's an anterior to posterior gradient of chemoattractants, and that steers the cells posteriorly. But there's a mediolateral gradient of uh, topography information that is uh, predominantly responsible for keeping these cells on the central path. Now, normally these um, cues co-op, you know, sort of work together and um, the border cells uh, migrate on the central path to the posterior. But the combination of experiments and modeling, you know, can provide us some insight into how the cells integrate and prioritize these multiple cues in order to choose one path amongst many. So when we topically express the ligand, we can see that if we express enough of it, and we know from Jocelyn's work um, from years ago that you have to express a boatload of ligand ectopically to steer the cells that way. And now that makes sense because we know that the ligand concentration is normally not what's responsible for keeping them on the central path. Um, it's this topography. So you have to express a lot of ligand to overcome that topography cue. We know that the adhesion loss will steer, will cause the cells to choose a path where they can find some e-cadherin um, on, on the follicle cells. Uh, and so the uh, e-cadherin is definitely a required uh, permissive cue. And then, um, and then from these off-center multicellular junctions, we can see that it's unlikely to be anything else about the central path, but rather the multicellular junctures sort of um, dominate uh, the, the path selection. Okay, so this is the team of people. This was an amazing collaboration um, that was really lots of fun with uh, Wei Dai as a former postdoc who was real, a leader and, and recruited Sharon Guo when Wei left the lab and Sharon um, did heroic amounts of work on, on this project. 
uh, Jim and Joe have been fantastic uh, collaborators who've helped with all kinds of uh, quantitative image analysis and um, and other aspects of the of the of the work. And then these are our wonderful collaborators: Nir Gov at the Weizmann, Wuderjan and Yuan Shen at the um, at UCSD, uh, and Brandon, of course. Um, hashtag Broad Mom. Okay. Um, okay. I'm gonna take a breath and. Um, it's good that you're all experts in cell migration. So that means I can go really fast. <laughs> so, oops. Um, so I wanna sort of step back and say, yeah, we're, we're interested in the lab in um, underappreciated under cell behaviors. And I know that it was heartwarming to see the this group appreciates collective cell migration so much. But like I said, back in the day, that was definitely um, considered an oddity uh, when we started working on it. And there's a number of other um, unusual cell behaviors that we have noticed um, and are studying in the lab. And one of them is the, a process we call the anastasis, which is recovery from the brink of apoptotic cell death, not a project I have time to talk about today. Um, and then, uh, you know, a project I will talk about today is what do cells do when they actually get where they're going. You know, in the whole field of cell migration, we focus a lot on how cells find their way while they're migrating, how they make protrusions, how they detach from the back. You know, we study a lot of things, but one of the things you don't hear a whole lot about is what cells do when they get where they're going. And I wanna talk about that today. Um, but uh, we also uh, have two, I have two postdocs in the lab who are studying a fascinating process of, of cell cannibalism. This is a border cell that has um, engulfed two polar cells, um, living two living cells. And so that's a pretty fascinating topic we've been studying lately, as well as um, something called adult reproductive diapause, which is um, also a sort of amazing stress recovery response. But today I'm gonna to talk about uh, this project here, um, the focus of a postdoc in the lab, Guangzhou Miao. So, how do migratory cells integrate into a new site when they get where they're going? Um, we know that both during embryonic development, whether we're talking about gastrulation, primordial germ cells, neural crest cells, or uh, lamination of the neocortex, cells migrate, but then they get somewhere and they make specific cell-cell connections when they get to their destinations. And this is also an important part of tumor metastasis. If cells couldn't integrate into a new site, they wouldn't be able to make a productive metastasis. So how does this work? And we realized or, um, that we, this was, the border cells were a great, are a great model for studying this, although we had never paid any attention to it all, all these decades of studying it. So um, it turns out that when the border cells are finished migrating, they associate both with the oocyte, which is the cell here, and with another group of epithelial migratory epithelial cells called centripetal follicle cells. I might call them CFCs because centripetal follicle cells, big mouthful. But anyway, these uh, are cells that migrate from outside of the egg chamber inside or centripetally and eventually join up. So you can see them here joining up with the border cells and eventually they reform um, an epithelium and they build an eggshell structure called the micropile, which is essential for fertilization. So here's the border cells before they delaminate from the follicular epithelium, as they're delaminating, as they're migrating, and then once they've reached the oocyte. And one thing you'll notice is that when they're part of the epithelium, this is their apical side. When they're migrating, they sort of do this 90 degree turn. So apical is somewhat orthogonal to the direction of migration. And then when they associate with the oocyte, they turn their apical surfaces back towards the oocyte. We can see this in a sort of higher magnification and then higher resolution here as the border cells reach out with a lateral membrane protrusion, touch the oocyte, uh, start turning and clicking their um, apical surfaces, docking their apical surfaces one by one into place and um, interdigitating, which I'll show you at higher uh, resolution later with the oocyte membrane. And then after they do that, then they uh, then the centripetal cells start migrating in from around the outside. And we can look at this if we take this, um, now you're used to looking at cross sections. If we take this section of the egg chamber and we turn it 90 degrees and look at it, you get something that looks like this. 
where we have the centripetal cell now touching the border cell cluster. And then these cells migrating this, this way. And right here we can see the um, border cell nuclei and the centripetal cell uh, nuclei. So if we look at this over time, we have the border cells and the centripetal cells here, and the centripetal cells move inward and eventually uh, connect with the border cells. And that's just shown again here, um, just to give you a sense of this process. So we're gonna call this process neolamination, sort of in, in uh, parallel to the well-established term delamination, where cells leave an epithelium. Now they're gonna join up with new partners um, and make new connections. So, um, so what molecular mechanisms govern this? Um, and our first clue came really when uh, Guanja was doing an RNA I knockdown of um, genes that we had identified years ago in a microarray analysis were enriched in either border cells or centripetal cells. And what he found was when he knocked down either one of two inexin proteins, um, uh, inexin two or inexin three, that the border cells migrated to the oocyte just fine, but then they didn't connect uh, up with the centripetal follicle cells. And at the end of migration or, or at the end of oogenesis, they were uh, back up in the nurse cells lost, kind of lost. So uh, we could quantify this and, and whether you knock down an exon two or an exon three, um, about 50% of the egg chambers show this phenotype. And if you knock them both down, uh, it's still 50%. So it suggests that knocking down either one is sort of removing the function of both. And, um, sorry. And that makes sense because we already know that an exon one and an exon, uh, and I'm sorry, an exon two and an exon three can co-assemble as subunits of gap junctions. So an exons are like connexins or gap junction forming proteins. And so these tetra span, you know, four transmembrane domains are, uh, constitute the monomer, the monomers associate into, um, into multimeric structures, and then they form hemichannels on one cell and the two hemichannels can dock together and form a channel uh, that, that binds two cells together. So um, if we look at the surface uh, of the epithelium like this, then we can look at the distribution of these inexin proteins and you can see they form these gap junction plaques in between these epithelial follicle cells. And if we knock down an exon uh, three, we lose both an exon two and an exon three uh, from the, uh, so this is, sorry, this is showing if we knock down an exon three, we lose an exon two. If we knock down an exon two, we also lose an exon two uh, from the cell surfaces. Um, whereas an exon one, which is a different um, uh, protein, uh, does not have that same effect. So, okay, so which cell types require in exons two and three? And, and our simplest hypothesis was that gap junctions would be required between border cells and CFCs. So we would expect that in exons would be required in both cell types, both the border cells and the CFCs. But what Guangxia found was that when he expressed the RNAi in the border cells only, then there was a neolamination defect but when, whether he knocked down an exon two or an exon three, but when he knocked down an exon uh, two or three in the centripetal follicle cells, but it was still expressed in the border cells, then there was no neolamination defect. Oops, turn that off. Um, there was no neolamination defect. So, um, so it seems that neither an exon two nor an exon three is required in the CFCs. Now, um, so that was puzzling because we had thought that we would be establishing gap junctions between these two epithelial cell types and that that would make sense. So, okay, but then when we looked more closely, we found that when we knocked down an exon two or an exon three in the border cells, that the defect was actually, we could perceive a defect before the centripetal cells were ever involved. We could see that normally the border cells dock their apical surface onto the oocyte but when we knocked down either an exon two or an exon three, that didn't happen. The border cells reach the oocyte, they touch the oocyte, but they don't turn and dock their apical surface onto the oocyte. Hmm. Okay, so, uh, so then we wondered, are there any inexins expressed or required in the oocyte? And so we used a different GAL4 uh, system to knock down 
um, to express RNA, inexin RNAIs in the germline. And there's one inexin that uh, produced a phenotype when we knocked it down in the germline. And that's uh, shown here. This is called inexin 4. It's also known as zero population growth or ZPG. And we could, um, we could see sometimes that there was a neolamination defect when we knocked down inexin 4. But there were other problems too. And you can see that the normally very smooth oocyte cortex is all wiggly here, and that the oocyte nucleus, which is normally in, in this one corner over here, um, was frequently out of place. But OK, so the question was, do inexins 2 and 3 in the border cells co-localize with inexin 4 in the oocyte at the border cell oocyte interface? And is there a gap junction there? And so, um, yeah. Um, and so we looked first for co-localization. And this is showing you um, the border cell cluster. And you can see that inexin 2 and inexin 3 co-localize uh, very well, whereas inexin 2 and inexin 4 really don't co-localize co um, at all. And this is not only true for the border cell oocyte interface, but it's also true for the other follicle cells interfacing with the oocyte. But maybe the light microscope just isn't high resolution enough. Uh, you know, um, maybe there's really something there. So here we uh, collaborated with Dorothea Goat, who's um, at, at the University of Toronto, and um, she did some electron microscopy, some TEM for us, so that we could try to see, well, where can we actually see gap junctions in the EM? And what she could find very easily, she could find gap junctions almost everywhere. She could find them between polar cells and polar cells, polar cells and border cells, border cells and nurse cells, follicle cells. She could find lots of gap junctions. But where we did not see them was between the border cell and the oocyte. What we could see, and you can see it right here, is that there are these very beautiful interdigitations between, so there's like Velcro between the border cells and the oocyte, but not gap junctions. So then we were like, well, maybe, you know, TEM isn't even high enough resolution. Maybe we just undersampled, maybe we didn't catch them. So we looked for functional gap junctions between the border cells and the oocyte. And we did this by using, a, I'll call it a thermogenetics approach. We used um, uh, a heat activated ion channel, which we express trip A1, which we expressed in the germ cells. And then um, we expressed GCAMP, this fluorescent reporter of calcium signal in, uh, of calcium uh, concentration in the all the follicle cells, including the border cells. So the idea was if we raise the temperature to 32 degrees where a trip would be, uh, the trip channel would open, then calcium would flow in. And if there were gap junctions, we would detect an increase in the GCAP signal um, in, in cells that would are connected by gap junctions to the germ cells. And sure enough, um, uh, Guanxia was able to see that um, he could see an increase in the GCAP signal in the epithelial follicle cells uh, upon shifting the temperature from uh, 23 to 32 degrees. However, uh, where he could not see such a signal uh, was in the border cells. So he didn't see an increase in, uh, in GCAMP in the border cells until the border cells connected to the centripetal cells. When the border cells connected with the centripetal cells, then he could see the increase in GCAMP signal in the border cells. So that says, well, we can detect a GCAMP signal in the border cells, but when the border cells meet the oocyte at the moment of neolamination, there are not detectable functional gap junction channels. And that's the quantification of it, but I'm gonna skip it for time. Um, but we could, and we could inhibit the gap junction channels we did detect, we could inhibit with a pharmacological inhibitor of gap junction channels, car carbonoxylin. So then we thought, okay, we can't detect the functional gap junction channels between the border cells and the oocyte, or, um, but, our functional gap junction channels required, I don't know, maybe between border cells or something for uh, this neolamination. So what Guanja did next was to treat the whole egg chamber with carbonoxalone to inhibit all of the gap junction channels. And we could show that we were inhibiting them effectively. And nevertheless, neolamination, both border cell oocyte interaction and border cell centripetal cell neo, uh, interactions occurred normally. So, 
this suggested together that gap junction channels, the channel function of the gap junction wasn't necessarily required for the border cells to, um, to do this interaction. And um, the final nail in the coffin <laughs> was that we made a point mutation or Guanja made a point mutation um, in an exon two. And this point mutation is known to eliminate the channel function, but leave other channel independent functions like adhesion um, intact. And this point mutation, uh, the inexin 2 with this point mutation rescued uh, inexin 2 knockdown as effectively as wild type inexin 2. So there were no neolamination defects when we re expressed either wild type inexin 2 or this L35W channel defective mutant. Um, there were no, but if we made a cysteine mutation, which blocks all inexin functions, then we failed to rescue. So that really suggests that it's a channel independent function of inexins. And so inexins and connexins are best known, of course, for being um, constitutively open channels that allow small molecules to pass from cell to cell. But there are some channel independent functions that are known. And so the question was, what are the inexins doing to promote um, neolamination? And a clue that we had was that the oocyte nucleus was mispositioned. And we know that the oocyte nucleus position depends on the microtubule cytoskeleton in the oocyte. So that's work from Dan Daniel St. Johnston and, and other labs. And um, so we wanted to know, does a nexin knockdown affect microtubules? And in fact, knocking down a nexin from, uh, uh, from the, in the border cells <laughs> um, does result in a, or and centripetal cells for that matter, it does result in a reduction of abundance of the microtubules. And knocking down um, an X and four also affects microtubules. And I'm gonna go quickly through this because I'm running out of time. But the bottom line is that inexins uh, somehow stabilize microtubules in um, both the border cells and in the oocyte. Other things are not disrupted when we knock down inexins. F-actin is not disrupted. Apical basal polarity of the cluster is not disrupted. There are many things that are not disrupted, but the micro microtubules are not as abundant in the cells. So is the reduction of microtubules actually functionally significant? And the answer is um, surprisingly, yes. So I've shown you the neolamination defect if you knock down an exon two or an exon three, but if you simply overexpress GFP alpha tubulin at the same time, there's actually a significant rescue of neolamination um, simply by overexpressing alpha tubulin. And that's quantified here. We rescue not only the neolamination defect, but also the oocyte position defect is rescued upon re-expression, uh, upon overexpression of alpha tubulin. So what's going on? Well, what happens normally is the border cells after they migrate interact stably with the oocyte and then the, um, and then the centripetal cells migrate in and uh, that interaction is stable just to the subsequent morphogenetic movements that are going on. You can see the nurse cells are transferring cytoplasm, the, the oocyte is growing and there's a lot of motion going on here. So here's another example of wild type. You can see there's a lot of churning motion, but what happens in the inexin two or inexin three knockdown is that when all that motion goes on, there's not a stable connection between the border cells and the other cells, and so they get washed away. And we could show that, um, that actually it's the inwardly migrating centripetal cells that are pushing against uh, the oocyte, and it's causing the oocyte to bulge out. And this happens normally, the border cells brace this contact, uh, the oocyte uh, membrane, and so when the centripetal cells migrate in, this whole thing is, is stable. But when the border cells don't have an exon or when there are no border cells there, then this centripetal cells migrating in creates this kind of herniation of the oocyte cytoplasm. And this is what pushes the border cells away and out of position so that they never get a chance to connect to the centripetal cells. So I'm just gonna skip this and cut to the summary because um, basically 
uh, let me see, I'll just go here to the highlights. This uh, work just came out online last week and it'll be out um, in, the, in the actual issue uh, very soon. And the highlights of this work are that, you know, uh, post-migratory border cells form new contexts in this multi-step neolamination process that we think is an interesting kind of understudied uh, part of cell migration. And we found that in exons two and three are required in border cells and in exon four in the germline for this process. And in exons two, three, and four regulate microtubule abundance during neolamination. And intriguingly, in exons and microtubules are required to brace this new contact against this external ongoing morphogenetic forces, which is something that I don't think we fully think about and appreciate that there's so much going on during embryonic development um, that there's a lot of external force. So, um, and I'm sorry, I'm running just a minute late, but um, I just wanna bring this around to like, well, what might the general significance of this be? And I wanna point out that like when the neural crest cells migrate out, they, um, they form the pigment forming cells in, in your skin. And they also form a, a couple of different kinds of pigment forming cells in zebrafish. And zebrafish are called zebrafish because they have stripes. Because after the cells migrate out, they assemble into these, uh, into these patterns that produce pig different pigment cells in different stripes. And there are mutants that disrupt this pattern and it's called leopard instead of, you know, because it's, it looks more like leopard spots than zebra stripes. And um, this mutation affects a gap junction connexin protein. So maybe this is a neolamination defect. Also when uh, neuronal precursors, when the, um, in the development of the CNS, neuronal precursor cells, uh, they migrate along radial glia. And this process requires a channel independent function of, a gap, of two different gap junction proteins. And this leading process is a microtubule rich uh, leading process that's important um, in this migration. And then this uh, paper from uh, Yuan, Massage shows that, uh, that gap junctions are essential for the metastasis of breast cancer to brain. Um, and so, uh, and, and important for the interaction between cancer cells and astrocytes. So it's possible that, um, that there are many neolamination uh, events that will turn out to require either channel independent or channel dependent functions of gap junction proteins. And since there are something like 47 different gap junction proteins in, in mammals, um, there's the opportunity for there to be um, many different um, functions. So this was a, a wonderful uh, project carried out almost entirely by Guangzhou Miao, a postdoc in the lab with our uh, TEM collaborator, Dorothea. Uh, reagents and uh, provided to us by uh, Guy Tenensop and Julie Simpson and Craig Montel, another Montel. Um, and, uh, and this is the view from our lab <laughs> when, when we get to work in the lab, which is not as often as it used to be. And I just want to acknowledge the whole lab because it's a wonderful group of collaborative, you know, exciting place to work and, and great people. Um, and so I'm going to stop there, stop sharing so I can see you and take any questions that people might have. Thank you so much, Denise. If people want to unmute their microphone so we can um, give her a round of applause. All right, so we have um, a lot of questions. Do you mind uh, sticking around for a bit uh, and getting through as many of these as we can? Not at all, and I see so many friends. Hi, Anna, hi. I don't know, I can't see everyone's name, but it's nice to see all my, um, all the, Colleagues here. If, yes. if people want to turn on their webcam so they can uh, be on, so Denise can see you, please yeah. feel free. Hi, Michelle. Yeah, <laughs> friendly faces are definitely welcome. And um, uh, if you typed a question and decide that you want to ask it yourself, um, you can uh, you can definitely do that. But we'll just start going through these. Um, so I'm going to start with a question, actually, uh, by Claudio Franco, who had to leave, but um, we'll have it up here in case he wants to check it out on YouTube later. So uh, what happens if you overexpress the all three major cytokines from the lateral follicular epithelia? Do the border cells still migrate normally to the oocyte? Mm -hmm. And um, can your simulation predict the movement of the border cells when you perturb the gradient in this kind of way? 
Mm -hmm. So we we haven't overexpressed all uh, three of them in all in all of the follicle cells, but we've done various combinations. And so basically, what happens is if you overexpress any of the ligands um, in in the anterior follicular epithelium, uh, it's interesting. Most of the time, the cells stay on the central path, but you know they're detecting that ectopic ligand because they reach out towards it, like they extend a protrusion out towards it. And they, and they reach out towards it, but most of the time they stay on the central path. Hey, uh, Yutaka is asking, are there any roles of tricellular junction markers like sidekick or biotactin in border cell migration? Also, sometimes dynamin accumulates at tricellular junction, suggesting they may have different membrane dynamics. So I think we're thinking about a tricellular junction is in a like an epithelium, right? So the nerve cells are not epithelial cells, so they are not going to have those traditional any kind of traditional junctional markers um, that would be at, at multicellular junctions. Can I just Maybe. ask though? But uh, the the nerve cells are expressing e cadherin, yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. So are they some sort of kind of, uh, they have a little bit of an epithelial phenotype. They're not epithelial, they're not polarized. They don't have an apical basal polarity to them. They they have e cadherin, but they don't make like adherence junctions because the e cadherence just kind of uniformly everywhere and it, it does hold them together. Um, but uh, but they're not, yeah, I can't I can't really, yeah, they don't have any markers of epithelial junctions. So maybe now that it has to actively suppress tricellular junctions, if they express the uh, cytokine, for example, they it blocks the way of uh, border cells, maybe. I just don't think the nerve cells are epithelial cells. And we, we no, have no, a, that, we that, have a they, they, they are actively suppressing the expression of tricellular junctions. If they have the tricellular junction like epithelial cells, uh, yeah. that completely seals the junction and blocks the way. Of the border uh, oh, I see. You're asking if we were to express the tricellular junction, could we block yeah. it? You know, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh, that's interesting. No, we haven't tried that. Uh, thanks. Adam, are you, uh, do you want to do the next one? Oh, am I doing this one? Okay. Uh, <laughs> Rohan is asking, just curious, have you tried looking at, oh, it's a similar one, tricellular junction molecules <laughs> and expressing these? Okay, that's a similar question I'll ask. Okay. I guess we uh, should do yeah. that. <laughs> I was uh, wondering yeah, about tricellular junctions too, I'll admit. So add a third person to that. Okay. <laughs> uh, Yoga Spurthy is asking, how do you factor in the effects each of these gradients with varying steepness of gradient or just the multiple simultaneous occurrences may impose on migrating cells? I'm not sure I understand that. But... Uh, yeah, I'm not sure I understand that either. But so, I mean, we have simply modeled, uh, so we have worked with NearGov before to uh, try to deduce whether the PVF, what, whether the gradients are more likely to be exponential or linear. And the data suggests that they're likely to be exponential. But when we do our modeling and simulations, either way, it doesn't change a whole lot whether the gradients are, are exponential or linear. So we don't think that, you know, we don't think that the details of the gradient uh, are going to have a huge impact, at least according to the modeling and simulations that we've done, the steepness of the gradient. Thanks. Uh, Alex Hershka asks, um, are the nurse cells squeezing the border cells? Is there any way to measure traction stresses? Hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think those are two separate questions. Are the nurse cells squeezing the border cells? There's uh, some evidence that um, from Jocelyn McDonald, she's done some uh, experiments that suggest that the nerve cells might be squeezing the border cells. It's actually a pretty stiff extracellular matrix around the whole thing. And there are the, the outer follicle cells are kind of squeezing um, the nerve cells, which then might be squeezing the border cells. Um, in terms of measuring, uh, so that that's probably hard to measure, but what, and we, we did try like with OJ Compass is our colleague here, we tried injecting some lip, uh, lipid dro or oil droplets in there to try to measure what the squeezing force of the nerve cell would be, but we, were, we weren't successful in doing that. Um, what I didn't have time to show you is that we can, see, we can see the border cells actually pulling on the nerve cells. So we can see that aspect of traction. Um, and, and there may be, we, we'd have to work on it. We haven't tried to, to figure out if we could actually um, back out some numbers about what those traction forces might be. 
Someone on YouTube is asking about uh, what you think the mechanism is behind inexins uh, regulating microtubules. Uh, yes. Um, so we, we don't know. We can see if we use antibodies against uh, sort of differentially post, uh, against post-translational modifications like um, uh, tyrosination or acetylation, we can see that there are different effects of the inexin on different post-translational modifications. But we, we don't really know what that means yet. So we have a couple of ideas. So one idea might be that the inexins at the plasma membrane are capturing plus ends of microtubules and stabilizing them. So that's one possibility. And so in the absence of the inexins, that it's not um, stabilized. Um, and so that we are losing, you know, newly formed um, uh, microtubules. Um, so that's one possibility. Another possibility is that the inexins are forming some kind of um, a scaffold for post-translational modification enzymes of the microtubules. And uh, Guanja and I have different bets on those two models, but, but because everything we predicted about that project was wrong every single time, like, oh, we think it's border cells and triple cells. Nope, we think there's gonna be gap junk. Nope, like everything was wrong. We're probably both wrong. <laughs> nice. Um, really, really cool. Uh, John Lee uh, asks if you can simply understand the off-center movement as a uh, sorting out per Malcolm Steinberg uh, due to lack um, of temporally deregulated cadherin adhesion. No. So it definitely, I, I don't think that's what's happening. We, that was our, my very first model years ago um, when uh, Danny Kai was in the lab. Uh, we thought that Mar the Steinberg model would explain why polar cells are in the middle of the cluster and express the most cadherin, border cells are around the outside of the cluster and express a little bit less, and nerve cells are around the outside of that and they express even less, and this would be a perfect sorting model. And it just doesn't hold up. Like it just, it, I could go through a list, a litany of experiments that doesn't, and so no, e cadherin concentration does not explain uh, a whole lot. <laughs> so. Even though it's very important, e cadherin is extremely important to many things in the system, but doesn't explain that. Thanks. Uh, Brian Cammy says, beautiful work. Uh, would the idea of cadherin unzipping underlying the topographic preference predict that cadherin overexpression in the nurse cells could also limit mediolateral positioning? Um, so I, I don't think so. So over, we've done the experiment. Um, overexpression of e cadherin in the nurse cells does uh, zipper things up a little bit more, but the relative space is still greater between where you know where multiple cells come together compared to fewer cells so the relative ease of going through um, the center doesn't change even though the overall level of cadherin changes and uh, and what we see is that they still take the the center path absolutely reliably uh, but they do move more slowly so and that makes sense Okay, um, Josh, Joshua Grohlman asks, is it also true that the topology cues are weak in the beginning of migration, then get stronger and then weaken again? Uh, yeah, so at the very beginning of migration, um, the, um, the, the geometry of the egg chamber is not as uh, fixed at the very beginning. So, um, and so there's a more variable uh, geometry, but we don't, we don't have any evidence that the topographical information is, is weaker because those, um, those multicellular junctions are kind of within reach of the border cells as they extend out. Truthfully, we don't understand the, the very initial decision about which way to go is a little bit more complicated and we haven't, we haven't focused, um, we haven't focused as much on that. Yeah. Do you have a sense of how far, far away a gap needs to be in order for a cell to say, Ooh, Ooh, I can go in that direction. Yeah. The, the protrusions that they extend can be, can be quite long. I mean, 20, 30 microns is not wow. um, unusual. Okay, it doesn't have to be right. And, and at the very beginning, there, there's a whole period of time at the very beginning where the cells, the border cells, like more than one cell is protruding out in there. And they take a while really to, to sort of, I don't know, for the leader to win or, you know, whatever it is. I don't know what they're doing all that time. But <laughs> there's a lot going on at the very beginning that we don't really understand. Very cool. Okay. 
Uh, Amrinda asks, uh, says, fantastic study. Do you see any change in migration rate with changes in juncture? So is there a stalling phase before border cells begin migrating, presumably at the two juncture point? Yeah, so they're, right, they're, uh, oh, a stalling point before they begin migrating. Yeah, interesting. Um, they do slow down um, at that point. Um, and uh, they, they, yeah, at that particular point where they lose the multicellular junction information, they do tend to slow down and then take this uh, dorsal path. All right, uh, so Raghavajan, uh, I won't try the last name, uh, has three questions. So I'll just ask you one by one. So first question, so the three cell junctions leave very little space, which means the border cells are squeezed, which would increase their persistence. So do you think there's a role for the squeezing? Yeah, um, possibly. <laughs> we haven't really, we haven't really investigated it. And as I said, you could, you know, uh, Jocelyn McDonald has a, a paper where she studies this, and, and if you um, remove myosin activity from the nerve cells and reduce their cortical tension, then um, this seems to, it doesn't really affect their trajectory, but it does um, impact on the, on the shape of the cluster. So there does seem to be some effect of the squeezing on uh, sort of the normal shape of the border cell cluster. Okay, great. Uh, so second question is, did you try to ablate the three cell junction to see if this would disrupt the border cell behavior? Ablate the junction. Oh, like- Or maybe like, just like, make a little so, more- Yeah, that would be hard to do. This is like, this is, this tissue is about a hundred microns thick and getting a laser into the center of it is, is, would be awfully tricky to do. So no, no, we have not tried to do that. Okay, but you would, I guess you'd hypothesize that if you were able to make a hole that they, a small hole that they would migrate in that direction. Yeah, we, um, yeah, the only thing we've done th that creates more space, uh, unfortunately doesn't allow them to migrate in that direction. So when we knock down cadherin, it does create more space in between the cells, but now they can't get traction. So they, they protrude like crazy in there, but they can't, they can't grab on. So they right. don't move, but it does, but we do, but it does have the predicted effect in terms of like enabling a lot of protrusion when you, when you uh, loosen up those nerve cell, nerve cell contents. Okay, cool. And then last question from Raghavan. Um, in the model, what creates the bias for the particle to stay in the three cell junction potential? In the model, what creates the bias for? Uh, so there's the topography term in the model, um, and I'm, I'm probably not the person to explain all the details in the model, but it will be available as supplementary text <laughs> um, uh, for those who are mathematically inclined to investigate. I don't know, I wish it is near there, <laughs> maybe near is there and could answer this question, or Wooderjad or, or Yuan Chen. Um, I, I'm not sure if I know how to answer that question. The, the model is, you know, incorporates, um, incorporates the concept of the more cells there are, the more space there is, the more energetically favorable that location will be. So that's, yeah. Okay, great. Cool. Uh, Pablo on YouTube is asking whether the central, whether the cells moving in the central path might be subject to different levels of pressure compared to other parts and whether you've checked that and whether that might be instructive. Yeah, so I mean we thought about that but um, but we th we think that the pressure would be equilibrated like very rapidly so we don't you know we don't think there's any way of maintaining a pressure differential so it didn't it didn't yeah that we didn't go very far down that road. <laughs> Great. Um, we have two questions from Ricard Alert. Uh, so first, are there ways to tune intercellular volumes? Um, I guess along the lines of some of the previous questions, uh, he can think of tuning cell tensions to make more cells more or less round or playing with the osmotic pressure in the interstices, etc. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we haven't done a lot of that. Um, and uh, 
there are in principle ways of, like I said, manipulating myosin activity in the nerve cells. Uh, the one way that does make the nerve cells really round is to remove the cadherin from them. Now they become very round, the spaces open up. And like I said, the cells protrude like crazy into those spaces, but since they get, can't get traction, they can't um, move into them. Um, tweaking myosin activity in the nerve cells in principle makes them a little bit more round or a little bit less round, but in our hands, it, it didn't, have a big enough effect for us to see to see the consequences of that. Yeah, and I think some of these questions are are um, maybe now that your work is out, other people will be looking for the same kind of behavior in other systems, and maybe we'll be more easily able to ask. Yeah, so them. different different types of like it's actually really hard to manipulate something like geometry of a tissue. <laughs> you know, so so first of all, your tissue has to have a regular enough geometry to begin with that you can even describe it uh, accurately. And then to manipulate geometry, it's not like you can just overexpress something or, or knock it out, right? So you have to get kind of creative about how you go about manipulating geometry. So I really hope that people will think about this as something that might be steering cells in other systems. Um, uh, but I warn you ahead of time, you're gonna have to think really hard about how to manipulate geometry because it's not trivial. Absolutely, I'm, maybe some bioengineering approaches could, okay, anyway, getting off into the weeds. Um, Rickard, second question, why is it important for cells to follow the central path? Ah, um, well, so we find when they follow the side path, like in an e-coherent knockdown, that they never really quite get to where they're going. And uh, so there seems, and we're not sure uh, exactly why that is, but there seems to be some kind of uh, obstruction once, you know, at some point along that side path. So it's probably important that they say, take the central path uh, just so that they can get where they need to go um, in this particular tissue. Cool. Great. Right. Uh, AJ, would you like to ask the question, your question yourself? Uh... <laughs> so uh, Denise, it's a fantastic talk. So my question was, uh, Actually, just sort of rephrasing the way you said that the cells, uh, germ cells follow where there are the most cells coming together. And so that's true. But does that phenomena basically occur because that determines the angle of juxtaposition of two cells? So if there's just two cells, then they're completely juxtaposed. But as you add more cells, that juxtaposition becomes less and less and less. Mm -hmm. And basically, it's easier for the cells to pry it open. So from a physics point of view, the reason it's happening locally is because the angle of juxtaposition is getting uh, changed so that it's easier to. That's another way to say it. Absolutely. Say it. Yeah. yeah. In a different way with an explanation for why the gap is there, I guess, rather than just simply the gap is there and it correlates with how many cells. Yeah, yeah, no, that's exactly right. That is the explanation for why the gap is there. The more, mm -hmm. like I showed it with the billiard balls, but the, yeah. the, the more cells that come together, just by the rules of geometry, the more space it's gonna be. Yeah. yeah. Fantastic talk, thank you. Thank you. All right, thanks. We've got uh, one last question from YouTube. Samya Madan asks, do you see neolamination defects if you destabilize microtubules in the oocyte? Ah, yeah, that's a good question. And, and we've tried and we haven't seen that. Now it could be because when you destabilize microtubules in the whole which is the only way you can do it is in the whole tissue, like you incubate the tissue in, in, in uh, colchicine or taxol or something, or in colchicine to destabilize them or taxol to stabilize them. And, and uh, the problem is just, you know, it affects every cell. And so, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't have the specific effect that sort of knocking down these different factors does. So no, we tried that, but it didn't work. Uh, Dennis asks, is there a role for heterotypic cell contacts in migration of border cells? Heterotypic cell contacts. So, well, there, there are multiple kinds of heterotypic cell contacts. So the border, so the, I didn't really talk about it, but there's two cells in the center of the cluster that are called polar cells and they're not migratory and they recruit the migratory border cells to surround them and, the, and each cell type requires the other. So the motile cells carry the non-motile cells and the non-motile cells are signaling to the motile cells. So they require one another for this movement. So that's one heterotypic interaction. And then the border cells are interacting with the nurse cells. So that's another type of heterotypic interaction that's going on. Um, so yes. I've, I've forgotten whether I asked the last question or Adam did, but um, uh, from Sayali Chowdhury um, says, 
Great talk, fantastic images, uh, agreed. Um, oocyte migration defect is a known classical phenotype of EGFR signaling loss. Do we know if there's a link between EGFR signaling in exons and border cell lamination? What was I, okay, okay, I think I know where this is coming from. Um, okay, so uh, if we knock down EGF receptor activity, now we're talking about in the posterior follicle cells, um, you don't get the oocyte nucleus migration. I think that's what exact. Can you say the question again? <laughs> Darn, yeah. away. So um, oocyte migration defect is a known classical phenotype of EGFR signaling loss. So do we know if there's a link between EGFR signaling in exons and border cell lamination? Okay, I'm a little confused by the question because oocyte, um, the oocyte yeah. doesn't migrate. Yeah, the oocyte nucleus migrates, but... Um, but I can't, um, I think he's asking if the position of the oocyte nucleus is involved in the elimination. And the answer to that is no, because if that's the question, <laughs> because the, in, in, when we knock an exons down and we get oocyte nucleus positioning defects, they don't correlate necessarily with the neolamination defect. So some egg timbers have an oocyte nucleus position defect, some egg timbers have a neolamination defect. They, they don't correlate, but they do both require microtubules. Okay, great. Um, yeah, and Sally, if you want to jump in um, and clarify, feel free. But in the meantime, I guess we'll move on to the last question. Yeah, this seems to be the last question. So if anyone has anything else off now, you can type it in or, or jump in after this. Um, I don't really understand this question, but I'll read out anyway, Denise. So it says, are any of these contacts or gradients involved in virus movement among human host cells? Aha. Uh -huh. Well, we have not looked, <laughs> so I couldn't tell you. Yeah. Okay. okay. Great. Uh, I think that's all the questions. Does anyone, if anyone has anything left over they want to ask, you can feel free to jump in now before we finish up. All right. That was a really, 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 really great presentation, Denise. Um, really appreciate yeah. you coming on and doing that. Thank you so much for organizing this series. It's been really, really great. I enjoy it.